7.30, it's Sunday, it's teacher squad time. Thank you for making the mental space for us tonight. We've got a lot to talk about. Tonight it is reading. Everything we need to know about reading and more. There'll be some tidbits, there always is. And if you've not been here before and it's your first time, you are most welcome. And what is this all about? Well, it's actually about um, us as teachers coming together to have an enormous big community think about issues that are really important to do with the curriculum. And to be fair, I can't really talk about design and technology or maths, so I just chunter on about English. Um, how it rolls is we're relaxed, uh, we're chill, we wear our pyjamas if you want to, um, you wear your hooked on books t-shirts if you want to, uh, you can be sober, you can be drunk, it's up to you but it's supposed to be a safe relaxing space for us to have a little nugget of CPD. Now, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of cheesy toast love in this group. We o we only deal in positivity and love bombs, and uh, this is a community that not only cares for each other, we care for each other's time, and we share and we give and we chunter on about teaching and learning ever such a lot. Um, if you want to uh, make yourself known, you can hashtag live sessions and then that means you can link up with other people on Facebook or Twitter. Um, thank you. It's not... Uh, shut up. All right. Talk about ruining me blinking flow. Yes, wrong ashed. This is my trouble. I have too many hashtags on the go. <laughs> what hashtag is it? I'll tell you what hashtag. It's not the one I've just said anyway. It's hashtag Sunday sessions. But just for the record, we'll put more in the mix because not only thinking, supporting and sharing, we've got out there, you know who you are. We've got some art artistic ones uh, and we've got some autistic ones, but we've got some gorgeous fabulous neat note takers and they share all their notes and that is just delightful. We're a, a really caring collective. You can run that hashtag if you want uh, and we are certainly the think with Incas but more than any of that and this is really crucial we are here because we are the magnificent mind-stretching marvels because hey we can see this like you might think we're an odd breed it's because we are an odd breed. We see this, this little nugget of CPD as relaxation. Now you might be thinking, um, I can do all this tech by myself and run the chat. The truth is, I can't. And I couldn't do any of this actually without my wonderful, supportive husband. See? I'm trying to be nice tonight. I'm doing really well. Uh, who's with me? It's Ian. He is a teacher. He does understand teacher words. He's, you know, he's not just a plumber, even though he does things like that for us at home. Thank you, Ian. He's rubbish at DIY. I don't know why I've said that. He, he can't even use That's a drill. Cool. Anyway, um, Ian is here running the chat. Introduce yourself, Ian, please. There's a good boy. Hello. How is everybody? Okay, I hope. I don't know why she's being nice to me. She's obviously after something. Excuse the gruffalo. I'm going to put it back to you, Jane. Yes, I think it's because I've got a lot of DIY jobs that need doing and there's a bit of a trade-off there. Anyway, um, thank you for being here and it is reading tonight. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, I've got a lot to say about reading because there is so much to say. In fact, I could talk about reading every day of the week and sometimes we have to hear things time and time again um, and it's not the same messages necessarily but it's this sharpening, this refocusing and we need reading at the heart 
of everything we do, of course, in the primary curriculum and beyond. Now, very specifically tonight, we're going to be talking about book talk. And this evening, we're going to have a journey into book talk, a deeper understanding about what I mean by that concept um, and how we make it work within our timetable. Because, of course, our job as teachers, regardless of the age of children we teach, we've got two things that we have to juggle and essentially we have to start with uh, getting children to um, learn to read and that is uh, done well, accurately, systematically, fast and furiously uh, with damn good phonics teaching and then of course uh, there's another big dimension to reading which is reading to learn and that whole sort of comprehension, uh, rinsing meaning from text and recognising actually that never goes away. You know, in our adult life, we're constantly learning from reading um, and we need both of those working well in our curriculum and uh, sort of that meshing together when actually we're still kind of smoothing over, let's say, learning to read, but we're also getting them to read to learn. So it's a tricky business. Um, so we're going to explore how certain things are going to ensure that we are a, as effective as possible uh, and that is uh, where our attention is going to be. Okay, I want to mention um, schools actually, and, I, and I've been to so many who do a really good job on promoting the pleasure principle of reading and ensuring right at the heart of what they do is space and time uh, to give time to a book and we've got to make sure at the bare minimum that is 10 minutes every day ring fence no matter how old the children are uh, one of my favorite places um, to read to children actually is in the reading garden uh, at long buckby uh, and this was a, a very small quadrangle quadrangle is quadrangle a word it yeah, is now it is, yeah. it, it was, it's a bit of a concrete you know uh space in between it's a uh it's a word four classrooms and it was a bit of dead space really and uh, the staff worked really hard to ensure it was a, a kind of became a shelter and there was this almost like garden like dome built and a garden theme created with grass and toadstools and it's just wonderful and a, and a wonderful space that um, you know the class could fit into and books being really important so uh, it's it's not just about the environment. We've got to get to a place that actually uh, we use these environments to put reading at the heart. It's, you know, books have to be the most important thing that is happening. Reading, essentially, has to be the most important thing that is happening. And uh, whatever space we create, it has to be created with reading at the heart in mind. Okay. Um, some of you who don't know me, some of you know me too well and you know who you are, but everything I talk about is locked in my book, Hooked on Books. I hope you can see that. Oh, hold it up. Hold it up in front of your face, it's Jane. A green screen. Okay. Um, Hooked on Books, but also we're really excited actually. Um, we've not had a lot of sleep. Uh, you know I like to zing, and sometimes I, I think I've over-zinged uh, this weekend because um, Hooked on Books training, um, that used to be kind of a day of training, we've uh, turned it into uh, a five-day or five-module course that you can um, unlock watch it when you want, uh, you know, it might be for you as an English subject leader, it might be to train up, um, you know, teaching assistants in your school or you're a maths and you need kind of communal messages, you know, across and you're kind of geographically a bit far from each other. It's um, 
that sort of mainstay of how we can really sharpen our reading curriculum. And more than any of that, I'm sober. So <laughs> what that means, I'm quite lucid for most of it. Uh, so you'll, you kind of get damn good training. And that other thing is you don't get overloaded because it is chopped and chunked into five modules and within those five modules there's little bite-sized chunks again it means you can say right I'm at capacity my working memory is about to explode I've uh, taken on those uh, three mo three moments locked in that and I can leave it there and you can return to it so that is something you know if there's anything that uh, lockdown has taught us there are better ways of accessing information learning and developing our own CPD oh yes Mr C is there any questions yes Denise is just saying how much is the, the online training game for lifetime access for lifetime access. Do you know what? I'm going to hand over to Mr. C now. Mr. C, over to you. Yeah, Jane's terrible with numbers. So I'm just going to do this. So the training is uh, just launched. We're very excited. And uh, we see that a lot of people have already opted into it. So this, this particular training is the Hooked on Books training. So this Jane does an in-depth view of uh, everything to do with the teaching and reading. Uh, she's also got the Write Stuff Online Training, which is everything to do with the teaching of writing, and most of you have sort of like seen bits and bobs of all of these things. But this is Jane's real tight focus on uh, the actual content instead of booze and boobs and all that sort of thing. So it's quite serious, but it's still Jane, you know, it's still fun, but it's very uh, complex. So to access that, if you're there as an individual, it's uh, £150, £149, something like that. And that gives you lifetime access. We do an easy term payment as well, where you can pay uh, fourteen ninety nine a month for the year, and then it's you. You've got uh, so you take that with you, whatever school you go to. There is a school access as well, which means everybody in the school can access it. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers on that, but if you go to the website, which is janeconstantine dot com. Um, and go to the online training the details are all in there um, and you can look at the other bits and bobs that we do on that as well so that's different to our resource website that's just does the online training and the unit plans but if you dive in there you can have a look around there's a few people that have um, already done the course for us so there's a I'm not sure if the testimonials are up yet but we've had a couple of people that do it and the feedback's been brilliant but um, but you know do, do go and have a look Jane, I'm going to put it back to you. Are you ready? Yeah. She's doing something on her iPad, you see, and I don't like to throw it on it so you see the top of her head. So I'm just giving her the fair warning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He doesn't like to, like, shine uh, a lens down my roots until I've been to the hairdressers. Because I let him do it then, of course. But, but not... hairdressers are opening again on that. Yeah, day. thank goodness. So, um, just to say, I just wanted... Do you know what, Mr. C, you might be able to help me by uh, looking on my diary, but I did want to have a big, massive shout out to Margie Bushell, who's retiring at Christmas, who's one of my schools that I work with in Essex. And I've been working with Margie for many, many years. And as an even though she's retiring, and I'm sure it should be the other way round, um, she is buying her staff as a leaving gift, hooked on books training. You know, how gorgeous is that? So, but a big, big heartburst love to Margie. Uh, and actually, I'm so proud of, of the writing standards in your school and how hard everybody has worked with, uh, really, particularly, you know. A, for me, that is a school, and Mr. C is going to find the name of that school for me because I've just it floated out my brain. Uh, you know, that school, if you want to see early years practice in action, that school is, has got it. Okay. I've got the name of the school as well. Well, we'll find out because so you're going to go online for me. It's one of our mainstays. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is the reading rainbow and how the reading rainbow Parkland's infant. Parkland's infant 
do you know what? I think it's because I've done so many lands and so many parks. It's in Romford in Essex. Romford, Essex, Margie Bushel. And you are. Oh, you, it is, do you know, I, I actually can't believe, um, you know, it's, you're retiring for a start. Oh my goodness. But yeah, great practice at Parklands uh, in Essex. Okay, I digress. The rainbow, the reading rainbow. This is at the heart. It's the visible mind frame. It's the clarity of a schema. It means we don't need a scheme as such. The reading rainbow enables us to pick that up and teach in whatever way we want to, in many ways. You know, if you are working with a novel, if you're doing some comprehension, um, if you're having, um, you know, a casual chat, or you want to have kind of some sort of discussion about a book, uh, we need to think about bringing the reading rainbow into that teaching and learning exchange. So it enables us as a teacher to remind us all the time about the wealth of competencies and, and the breadth of, of all the different ways we need to interact with books. Um, and they almost act as doorways and lines of inquiry. And as we pass over into those doorways and let's say we open the door of text structure and layout within that then there is so many conversations we can have about let's say in story where chapters begin and end is it a cliffhanger um if it's not a cliffhanger um, what are we left with before uh, a new chapter starts? Is there a passing of time? Is there a mic drop moment? Is there comedy? Is there a not knowing? Um, all, all of these things, all of these conversations, why is that bold? Why is that bigger? Why is that in a bubble? You know, and the, the reading rainbow acts as that um, mental facilitator for us to navigate down these pathways uh, and become very good reading detectives as we gather evidence and clues to draw conclusions. Now, once you've got the reading rainbow in your life as a teacher, no matter how you want to teach uh, reading for meaning, um, you'll really think, well, actually, what did I do before I had this? Because um, the beauty of it, it's on one piece of paper. The beauty of it is we can hold it in here and it's organized into the ideas of reading there, um, the skills of reading and the competencies of reading. And there's this real sense of, um, we, we know that uh, we, are, we know all the different lenses uh, lenses of looking, in fact, that children need to become adept in. So what we're going to talk about tonight, very specifically, uh, with the rainbow uh, guiding your teaching and learning, underneath that, um, in a practical way, how does book talk help us take that rainbow and actually make it actionable? in the classroom. And I'm gonna to talk tonight about how to bring this rainbow to life and very specifically, I suppose, how to, uh, um, you know, lift it off the page. And so it works for us. Um, so I'm gonna talk closely tonight about book talk. Now, book talk, happens and you've heard me say this before if you've not I'll say it again we want a lovely mix of different approaches to reading but book talk is the mainstay and really you want to try and organize bare minimum about um, five book talk sessions over the cycle of two weeks now you're gonna ring fence about half an hour uh, for your reading teaching. We're just focusing 
on the teaching of reading. That half an hour is going to happen every day. Uh, and the, of that daily provision, five of those sessions over two weeks are going to have that feel of book talk. Now, book talk uh, is where we are coaching the children to read for meaning. Um, we're coaching the children to uh, develop their banks of stored words and chunks of language to illuminate their thinking. And how we organise it in our class, uh, and it's that level of instant differentiation, um, we organise the class into attainment groups. So let's say the owls here are reading uh, Malamanda. Is that how you say it? Malamanda. Thomas Taylor. I suddenly couldn't pronounce that. Uh, Lights on Cotton Rock. They're the beavers. And then here, A Story Like the Wind by Jill Lewis. Now, I know, and I'm just going to slide this bit of information in there. I know there are teachers who have a whole class novel and don't organise um, their reading teaching like this. And that is also great. However, one of the, one of the things we found that actually, um, if you make your more dominant teaching, this differentiated uh, chunks, then it acts more realistically um, in a more, you get more realistic judgments of where children's reading capabilities are. Now, I'm not anti whole class novel, I'm actually a fan of that as well. But when we're all together reading, let's say Rooftoppers by Catherine Rundell, you have to just be mindful that that's not the only provision they have because what we can sometimes do as a teacher is inflate that kind of communal understanding of how well they know it. And sometimes, not that we do things for tests, but down the line when we do test them, we think they're a lot better at reading for meaning than they really are because we kind of get this communal, oh, we love this book, don't we? You get it, don't you? And almost we've plug too many of the gaps rather than recognising more in a kind of a litmus paper way the reality of where they are. So uh, just be mindful that you have an, a nice mix of uh, actually checking out how well they're doing themselves with reading. So this is, you've got half an hour of time and you're chunking them into these differentiated groups and these are pitched uh, you know, broadly at their level that they can read these books independently. Okay. What you're also going to do is you are going to park your arse, as it were, that's your professional arse, with a group. From the kids' perspective, it will feel whole class, but actually you, every day that you're doing book talk, will sit with a different group. Okay. Now, once you've got that in place, you are going to now work with reasons to read. And your reasons to read come from the reading rainbow. And book talk lasts half an hour. And you zoom into your first reason to read. And this reason to read is coming from the fantastic tier. And just for tonight, just for the hell of it, I've chosen feelings. These become lenses of looking. When we do book talk, we only ever have three reasons to read and we take 10 minutes on each reason. And how we run it is the children are sitting in their attainment groups, it feels whole class and then I say to the class, right, we have got a book talk session happening now and our first reason to read, you're going to be reading detectives. The reading rainbow is organised beautifully generically, and it really doesn't matter if you're reading Lights on Cotton Rock or Malamanda, you're going to be reading like a detective on the lookout 
you might not find anything, but you are on the lookout for feelings. Also, bear in mind, when you pick up a lens for looking, we're also getting children to have those, the very thing they're not very good at, actually, that summary thinking, that big idea stuff, as they're looking for feelings, we're tuning their brains into, actually, are you finding positive or negative feelings as you trawl through the text? We set them off to read around the group, maybe reading two sentences each or a paragraph each. We make the teacher judgment around that. And just to make, and I'm just kind of showing you here, this group here, the owls are reading Malamanda, okay? And they are on the lookout for feelings. They're going to be reading Malamanda for about six to seven minutes. They're going to take it in turns and they've all got the book each. And as they read it, they're reading like detectives on the lookout for feelings. And they're not writing anything down, but they're reading with a switched on excited mind, thinking, ah, oh, hmm, yes, Herbie, well, that can't be right. Hmm, that sort of reveals that he's puzzled about that. Oh, uh, look, even Mr. Mollusk, the hotel manager, can't argue with that. He'd like to, of course. He hates anything in the hotel that doesn't make money. Mm. So there's these different feelings coming through. This is definitely negative. This is could go either way. So that's the owls reading Malamanda. That's their reading detective brain, sort of trawling and gathering. Then we've also got the beavers. Now, the beavers are reading uh, a story like The Wind by Jill Lewis. They're reading for the same amount of time, being uh, reading detectives. And as they read, they're on the lookout and they, they can see uh, different feelings coming through. Can I, can I oh, you can yes. Well, yeah, of course you can. High. Yeah, uh, nice and loud though, so, Mr. C. Yeah, so I have lost the question, but in essence... Two questions. Number one, uh, I can't see who asked it now, sorry, but they asked if, uh, would you just concentrate on one lens at a time is the first question. So you can answer that. Yes, I'll do that first. Don't overload me with questions because I can't cope. So you've got half an hour for book talk. You've got the reading rainbow. And what happens is you set up your book talk session to have three reasons to read. So let's say my reasons for this session are going to be, uh, we're going to read to find feelings. Then we're going to read um, to uh, predict what happens next. Oh, you absolute uh, silent letter door handle. Right, just put that down there. Predictions is down there. That's State and predictions. Handle, yeah. Thank you. And let's say this is setting. Yeah. So let's say we're going to read for feelings, top tier, fantastics. Then the settings there uh, on stylistics and predictions down in the analytics. They're the three reasons. We've got half an hour. We're going to have 10 minutes at looking at feelings like a reading detective then we're gonna have 10 minutes looking at the setting like reading detectives and 10 minutes looking at predictions now i know what your question's getting at i think when you're reading at any point there'll be loads of stuff you can find so but don't yes. don't look at loads of different lenses you look at the lens you've been tasked to look at so the answer's no mr c not yes you focus on one lens at that moment to be a reading detective. So that is a yes. I don't know what the question is. Do you just focus on one lens? Do you just focus on one? Yes. That okay. was easy. The second question has come from Keanu. Now, uh, what Keanu is asking is... Can everyone hear you? Uh, right, let me go. I think, because I'm going to answer this one actually. Do. Because I can do that. So Keanu is basically asking, I can't find this question now. Oh, uh, so Keanu is, uh, is, uh, is saying that he's, he's, he's drawing in the resources, questioning, all the planning, all that sort of thing. It's a real pain, isn't it? 
the, the way that you can remove all of that hassle from your life, everybody, is with one, one of our products that we sell. And a few people are talking about it in here on, on the chat now. And that's the interactive reading rainbow. Are you talking about the interactive reading? Right, okay. So the interactive reading rainbow is basically a thing that you, you pop on your interactive whiteboard and you can press it and do all sorts of things with it. And it, it generates all your sentence stems, it generates your lens, uh, and it generates, what else? It, oh, uh, bonus words, it's a really excellent piece of kit. So go and have a look on the website. In actual fact, in the description to this video, I will put the link to it. So that's the other question. The other question, Jane, that I think we should address now is because you're talking about group layout and I'll answer this, shall I? So at the time of filming, we are going through the uh, pandemic, COVID crisis, and schools are under um, strict uh, guidelines now. And each school is slightly different. And some of the questions that are popping up in, in the chat at the moment are asking about, you know, if we're going to work with a group, you know, what do we do when it's in you know, you've got all your children in rows and all that sort of thing. This, it's very difficult for us to be able to answer that definitively because obviously everybody's got their own uh, risk assessments, their own guidelines that they're following. So if you've got some really good ideas, if you pop them in a the chat, I'll put them on the screen uh, because, uh, you know, Jane's, uh, this system is going to be for life way beyond the uh, when the pandemic is over so you might well be watching this when we will absolutely all this thing might be a distant memory by the time you watch this so i'm going to put you back to jen okay so we are taking 10 minutes out of that half an hour we have children in attainment clumps they have lenses for looking and as they look at text I mean, and to be honest, these can be organised. They can have lenses of looking if they're reading individually. They can have lenses of looking if they're reading in pairs, reading in groups, reading in rows, reading outside, reading on a different planet. You know, it's a way of um, sharpening all the aspects that children have to make comment on and be good at to leach uh, down their own meaning and go beyond the words for themselves. Now, if you look here, this group here, our oh, little darlings, they've got Lights on Cotton Rock by David Litchfield. And again, they are doing exactly the same. They are finding light detectives words. Now there's no jottings at this moment. This is them just being aware as they read, read closely. Ah, oh, reading closely on the lookout, actively on the lookout for um, textual evidence for feelings, okay? Now, once that has happened, we move as a whole class teacher and crack open that reading exchange at that moment and slice into the teaching and learning a sentence stem. A sentence stem that insists what we're trying to do there by slicing in that sentence stem, we want them to talk a comprehension answer that is sophisticated, formal and extensive. So this, there's two components to this uh, that are really critical. Number one, um, and this is me here in the classroom uh, under first reason to read uh, using the lens of action and I'm, I'm about now to introduce the sentence stem I've not told them what it is yet I'm going to tell them and I'm going to write it down so here's the sentence stem for feeling a positive negative emotion that is revealed is and I'm going to assist, insist rather that they all use that, whether they're reading Lights on Cotton Rock, whether they're reading, um, you know, Malamanda, whatever they're reading, they're going to use that sentence stem. And then I'm also going to insist that they use a high utility word. Now, this high utility word is, and, and we've got to recognise high utility words, we can broadly organise into two camps. Camp one, uh, beautifully ambitious, but very context specific. And they tend to be high order words, 
for story. You know, words like dilapidated, silhouette, uh, gossamer, you know, those sort of words. And then there are these other high utility words that have high leverage, very, very powerful, very powerful to be good at nonfiction writing, very powerful to be good at reading comprehensions, um, very, very powerful for test situations. And these words are more generic. And they are our mainstay when we're trying to explain ourselves. Um, these give high leverage. So when I am training these kids to talk a damn good comprehension answer that's deep and formal and strong, I'm going to scaffold their experience. I'm going to give them the wire outline so that they then can weave their words and extra language around them. I'm going to give them a sentence stem that I insist they use. I don't care what book they've read. In fact, I don't care if it's a whole class novel, they're still going to have a sentence stem. And then I'm also going to insist that they use a beautifully generic high utility word. Mr C, are there any questions? And yes. can you go on camera so people can hear right. you? Okay. I'm Good gonna, boy. I'm gonna ask a question on camera. Yes, just okay. so people can hear the question properly. And then I'm gonna flick it straight back Good to you. Good boy. So there's a, well, there's a comment. So, um, right, Miss G has said, I found the high utility words have really improved my children's reading answers. Simple, but effective. So that's a comment from Miss G. Um, Oh, there's my poster. It's the ghosts. Um, right, uh, Joanne Hancock said she's finding it really hard in year one to use the reading rainbow. Uh, she spends a lot of time reminding the children of the... The children of the sentence. They're not as hard as I'm finding it using the reading rainbow. Uh, she's, uh, she's reminding the children. Is this just me? I would say they're just getting into it. But I'm going to put it on to you, Jane. Or anybody else who's got an answer? Uh, yeah, book, book talk will not be a slick beast to begin with. It does require training. But a lot of that early training with book talk, remember to, as well, keep your sentence stems much simpler when they are younger. But we've also got to be quite insistent because they'll get excited about books and you have to say right I like what you're saying Aaron but can you say the setting is interesting and then tell me what you were saying so it's almost like you it's don't worry that there's loads of reminders the other thing you know if you want kids to be really good at it there's you can give them points you get one point for using a sentence stem you get another point for using a high utility word and you get another point for giving me a really good idea. And if you can show me, you know, evidence that's pictorial, another point. If you show me evidence of words, you could get four points. We all know what points make, don't we? So it's that sort of, uh, you know, and that your high utility words, there's your sentence stem, there's your word because. Now they will have... They will want to talk about books. I'll be bubbling over with excitement. But we've got to be quite insistent about it because we want them to work with chunks of sense. Sentences is where it's at for working memory. Sentences is where we need them to be in their thinking. If we can get them to talk like that, they can then construct it in writing. And then we've got that, that wonderful talking a comprehension answer. No, I know down the line when we're, you know, we've, we've also got to uh, train them to do quick one word answers, but I'm talking about a bigger mission than testing. We want them to have deep, reflective understanding for books. So a lot of that is uh, around, um, you know, uh, training, I would say year one person. Don't beat yourself up. You know, it is, it is hard. I've, I've taught so many book taught lessons where, you know, it's almost because of routines and training. Do you know, I fall on my face. And, you know, what do you want to do? You want to go and put your head in, you know, 
a Victoria sponge with double cream. I have four eclairs and a scone and a bottle of gin. And does it help? A little bit but that's not the point the point is it's not easy and that's that sort of training aspect of teaching okay move on, move on. Uh, right now just so you can see here uh, and I've, I've done a kind of a, a capture there of when you get the children to construct their spoken answer. You know, this isn't written down. This is me showing you so I can read it out to you. The sort of things you, you know, this is at a year five level, but this is the sort of thing we need them to do. So this would be kind of your lights on cotton rock group. We're going to listen to that group. As we listen, we're listening not thinking, oh, this is boring, we haven't read that book. We're listening on the quality of their answer. We're listening because we haven't read it. That very thing, because we haven't read it, are you good at revealing your reading for meaning? Because if we don't know what you're rambling on about, then it hasn't got clarity. So that's almost as well how we're training their listening ear. So this is the Lights on Cotton Rock group saying both a positive and negative emotion is revealed. On one level, hope feels positive in this story. It is a hope for Heather to leave Earth. And this hint, she's not happy here. But when hope is put with wanted more than anything to leave Earth, it makes the reader consider, is this because of her fascination with space? Or is, she, is the reason her unhappiness on Earth? So this is this group having a go at saying, is it positive? Is it negative? There's a bit of a contradiction. Uh, what we've done as a teacher is we've started them off with this. Um, let me just make that a bit bigger so you know what I'm doing here. We've started them off with this, you know, uh, sentence stem. We've insisted on them using this consider. And together as a group, they can um, interrupt each other, knock it into shape. And we can listen along and go, yeah, we, we know what you mean, even though we haven't read it. Now, um, and this is what I'm saying here. We want to listen to that group. We want to check in with their depth of thinking. Uh, we want to have clarity from their answers because we haven't read it. And... That is that other thing where book talk, schools who do book talk, uh, and I'm checking in with um, Mark Richards tomorrow, who's who's been one of my early uh, fly flaggers, I don't know, advocates of book talk for so long. And Mark's reading results are astounding. Um, and it is... Sometimes a whole class novel can mean that we skim and skirt and can assume. Not always, not always. There needs to be this lovely mix where book talk uh, helps them sharpen the quality of their art of communication so that we can have, really, you want a curriculum, a teaching and learning curriculum where you have whole class novel, yeah, and these shared moments of coming together. You want book talk in there where we, we assess how well that attainment group is going and it's all based on assessment. And then we have another part of our reading curriculum where it's based on that strong modelling, that modelling of how to read, but also that modelling of how to write good comprehension answers uh, and all of that together means that we've got really strong excuse me bubbles robust curriculum i think you've seen me burp on camera more, more than anybody it's right not burp. it's not even a prosecco burp <laughs> thank you mr c we'll leave it there stop embarrassing me okay so our second reason to read is when we go to the second tier and this, it doesn't matter what one you pick up, they're all going to be powerful and uh, light uh, a child's way, uh, a way to look at, gather and navigate. Uh, and again, this one all about uh, yes and no relationships, you know, 
who who is the central character having a relationship with you know is it positive is it negative and uh what the children do is they carry on reading the book they carry on reading from where they left off they don't go back and reread they carry on moving and as they look at this lens and this is the you know the malamanda group keep reading but now they're looking for well actually herb is our central character we found out about herbie already but he bumps into this girl is it positive is it negative on one level if you just look at the verb you know shove you'd say well that sounds quite violent if that's the first thing he does is shove her but he shoves her inside a trunk because he's trying to hide her from kind of this high crisis incident he can't quite work out what's going on but he can sense she's in trouble and he hides her so this is a really that's going to be quite hard for children to explain this sudden shove um and we can also feel that uh, there's somebody new in the hotel who might be after the girl and we talk about looms and dismal and he stabs the bell like it's, you know, like it's a knife. So this sort of sense of, um, you know, something looming out there, scary that they don't know about and this girl that he's trying to help. So there's a lot of things to explain there. And um, actually, we could look at that through the lens of feeling, through the lens of action, through the lens of sight, through the lens of prediction. And that's why the reading rainbow is so beautiful, actually, because it's beautifully generic, but gives us a way that we can be more focused and sniper attack in our thinking. So once we've got that relationship lens in the room, we then send them off with a sentence stem. They haven't got long, you know, they've got two minutes or so to gather an answer, a spoken comprehension answer. Our main character has a positive or negative relationship. So we can say our main character, Herbie, has a positive relationship with the girl. He suddenly meets her and he feels he has to help her. We can see he wants to help her because it's a shove, but he's also on the lookout uh, that she's properly hidden and nobody comes to find her. Then we share the high utility word. You know, this is confirmed by, you know, and then we can give in evidence. And why we want children to use these high utility words is because words like confirmed, reveals, suggests, hints, and others. And if you want your own collection, download the book talk bonus words. There are five on the Trend Space website. Uh, we need kids to have more words, not less words. They need to build up their stored words, and we need them to be word hoarders. But I want them to be word hoarders where they know not only what they're collecting, why are they collecting these words, and why are these ones, these beautiful generic ones we use in book talk, so powerful for thinking? Because they are the ones where you can talk about nuance and subtle, subtlety and contrast and the direction of your thinking. And this is why you need these, and these are different from... Uh, words you might need for story. So that is really crucial that children understand that distinction, that these word hordes are our illuminating thinking words. Okay, and this is an example now of, you know, what they'd say, giving their feedback, using the word confirmed. Her urgent entrance and lack of talking makes her be realised she is in trouble. This is confirmed. And we're like, oh, beavers, did you just use confirmed? Wow, there's a point. This is confirmed when he shows his empathy for her crisis situation because he helps her by the shove to put her quickly in the trunk. That would be a classic four-point book talk answer. They use the sentence stem. They talk about their book in detail. They use the high utility word and they include evidence. Boom. Yeah. Okay. 
every book talk session, we move to the third reason to read. We're down now in the analytics down here. And this is where we're picking up some of the trickier stuff. And this is all about personal opinion. What do you think about the book? And now, um, so for example, the this group that's reading um, oh, the Jill Lewis book, um, A Song Like the Wind, we're asking them to draw out what they think about it, uh, things they've noticed, is it positive, is it negative, what bits do they like, what bits don't they like. Um, and often when I work with um, assess the author or have an opinion, I talk about stickability. There will be words, there will be phrases, there will be pictures that you kind of, that, that you stick to, that they feel sticky to you, your brain sticks to them, you feel a connection with them. And that stickability is, will be different for different children, uh, for different ages. And that is about um, when a book talks to you. And, and where, are, where are those sticky moments for you as a reader? Um, again, here, uh, we're going to ask the children to use this stem. The writing was effective, ineffective when. We want them to use the high utility word emphasise and we're insisting all the time on this language of comprehension. A bit like the teacher earlier who's teaching year one, they will want to uh, slip out of using the language of comprehension because it makes it harder for them to build. It's easier for them to pick up all the le Lego bricks and put them together how they want to. But we're actually saying, no, we want you to follow the Lego instructions inside the pack. We want you to build a Millennium Falcon. A Millennium Falcon that is that detailed and rich in talk. I know you want to build a giraffe with a boat to arse, but you're not allowed to do that today. I'm insisting you build the Millennium Falcon of talk. And these are the instructions. And just as you're trying to put that piece there, I'm going to ask you to put this piece there instead or add in extra um, Lego bricks of talk for you to construct it in this way that is more formal, that is more sophisticated because I want you to build up uh, your strength in how you think and talk about books. Okay. So here now, uh, again, we've got a really good answer where they've used the stem, they've used the bonus word. The writing is effective, particularly at the moment the fellow travellers are described. The text is loaded with negative language to emphasise the trauma of the situation. Also, the author talks of the refugees in the boats as ghosted by the moon, and this death theme figurative language means they are presented as a homogenous group, not individuals. Now, for book talk to work, do I have to give lots of spoken answers? Yes. Does Mrs. Gibb have to give lots of spoken answers? Yes. Do I have to showcase when I'm quoting from the text using air inverted commas? Yes. All of that. Um, do I have to give them more language chunks, not less, early on? Yes. And it isn't going to happen quickly or easily. But the wonderful thing about the Hooked On Books approach is that we do it in talk. And then when we do demonstration comprehension, and I'm going to talk about demonstration comprehension next week, and I'm going to talk about it in relation to non-fiction. So that's coming next week. We're also going to model it in writing. So that children get almost two cracks at the whip. The spoken, strong comprehension answer here, but also the written 
pension answer as well and they'll work in unison. Couldn't you come up with some way yes. in which you can describe this in great detail to everybody? Yes. Would that be the best way to do it? I think so, Mr C. If I could, if I had a chance when I was sober, uh, it was a bit slower, a little bit more measured. Uh, we could take our time together. I could walk you through. I could hold your hands. Well, as if by, by magic. magic. That's, that's exactly, exactly what, what I've done. done. I've, I've got, got my five, five module, module hook hook tom books. Hold, hold your, your hand. hand. Uh, uh, training. training. On, on what, what this, this reading, reading curriculum, curriculum is. is. So, so the sharp, sharp is it's explicit, explicit and it's and accurate. accurate. Uh, uh, on, on those five, five modules, modules, I'll show you in a lot of detail. I'm going to do a little, little glimmer of it next week, but we're going to talk about demonstration reading. I'll get you to really understand demonstration comprehension. We spend a whole module on book talk and what it means as well as the icing on the cake, how we uh, truly foster responsible readers in our school. Um, and once you're in the family, you've got access for life, forever, or until you leave teaching and think, I'm going to John Lewis. You know, whatever you're gonna do, that is, that is yours uh, and up for grabs because, you know, the teaching of reading is so critical um, and this is a way that it's, we can, you know, you can have it in bite-sized chunks. I mean, we, you'd have to take my word for it. Um, I've got schools who will um, shout from the mountains about the impact Book Talk has had on their results. And, but we've also had Louise Clark uh, from the Tillian Partnership who's lived the training um, and uh, she talks about invigorating her practice, uh, enriching subject knowledge and the provision. So uh, if you want to get involved... Uh, We've also had Matt Tarado do it, who's just popped on to the chat. Oh Matt, Matt is like, we, I mean there's super fans and a super, super fans who are super. Uh, uh, Matt Tarado has also accessed the training. And I think the thing is, without getting over Janified or getting having too much Jane in your life, who needs that? No one, apart from Mr. C. Um, essentially, and I think Matt and others will vouch for this, who've accessed training in this way, it's that sense of you don't have to do it all at once. You can rewind, you can come back again, and uh, you can kind of take it on slowly. Uh, and that's really important. Okay. Um, I've got no more messages. I've got a couple, Mr. C, but nothing major. Have you got anything you want to say before we go? Oh, have we got time to, have we got a sale? We've still got a sale on these till right, midnight. That's what I was going to say. So, hold on a minute. Yeah. So, basically, what... Uh, uh, the so we've got our black friday what is the black friday thing people keep on so we've got black friday so so we've got black friday going on till tonight so that's tonight at midnight so i know a lot of people are talking about interactive reading rainbow the, the black friday is only for resources so these are the um what are they called large reading rainbow, large reading rainbow symbol sorry so these are the reading rainbow symbols. These are the large ones. We've got little ones as well that are about that big. Um, so they're currently, I think everything's 25% off and the code is BLKFRI25, but it finishes at midnight on Sunday the 29th, which is today of November. So if it's that date's gone past, then don't. Also, if you're a member of Kai Adams' Teacher Squad group on Facebook, which if you're not, you should be, uh, if you go onto there, you there is a, a discount code that is for Teacher Squad people forever. So that, that lasts forever. Now, that we the, those discounts don't count for the online training, though. They only count for the physical resources of this. What, what's that symbol again, Jane? It's completely left my head. It is... Early years. Early, early years. years, sorry, yeah. So that's an early years one. But we have early years reading and, and writing. 
I would suggest, because a lot of people sort of like would want clarifying on some of these parts, you know, do speak to people in the T-Squad about it. So there's been thousands of people who have done the right stuff training. Um, speak online training. I know Amanda's been going on about it in here and she loves it. But do have a chat with people. The way that it works is that it's broken down into bite-sized chunks. Each of those bite-sized chunks last between about 5 and 15 minutes. The beauty of it, Jane goes into everything in real deep detail and you can keep going back and revisiting. So if you're not sure about something or something's not quite working right, you can go back and say, oh, what is that bit about demonstration comprehension again, as an example. But if you're gonna get anything, get it on that discount as soon as, so the Interactive Rainbow is a great one, which I think is about 40 pounds. So with the discount, it's about 30 pound. I might be wrong about those numbers, but in, an, in a nutshell, that's it. Are you, do you want to go back, Jane? Okay. Yeah, all I was going to say, I've got no more messages other than don't miss next week because when we talk about um, demonstration comprehension next week, to be able to get a really good example um, through the lens of non-fiction, that's going to be really powerful because how I want you to think about your reading curriculum in terms of big messages is you want a, str a strong talk spine and a written spine that's all about um, reading to learn, okay? So actually today's the spoken uh, structures and then next week the written structures that coming together of putting children in a really strong place. So. Just to finish off, uh, my final couple of messages. Number one, for us to get to a place where our reading curriculum is vibrant and colourful and special, uh, that isn't happening by accident. That is happening when we put books at the heart of our work, where we profile words, uh, words that are going to uh, extend their imagination, as well as words that are going to help them illuminate their thinking. Um, and this happens when we have a curriculum that is well thought through, uh, is careful and clearly explicit. Now, on another note, tomorrow at half past ten, and if you're not yet in it to win it, you could still slice in, because tomorrow at 10.30, you know, even if you've missed the current experience day, you could still hop on tomorrow at half ten, uh, up until um, when we finish. Can't remember that day, but it's about oh, uh, it's about two and a half weeks. You can get involved with my Christmas star, the 15th of December. So we start on Monday and we finished on the 15th of December. Uh, you can go and download the my Christmas star unit and log on to YouTube, get involved. And at 10.30, I will teach your children. Okay, and that is something worth thinking about. If you've not even thought about it yet, you have still got time to get on it. The last one we did was Feast. Yeah, the last one we did was Feast. There is an explanation video on YouTube that you can watch about how to get involved. And you can watch that tonight and turn it around. Okay, so if you want to get involved, you can. And even if you don't do it live, I know there are lots of catcher-uppers who go, right, we're going to do it the following week. Okay, so there are things you can do to kind of slice in. Um... This is my final big up uh, to my gorgeous home slice, Mrs. West, who posted on Twitter uh, her clean bandit uh, showdown hoedown. Uh, they were doing uh, aerobics, they were doing singing. Tell me what they were doing. They were dancing, they were moving, they were grooving probably rewind the singing. They were singing in their head. Uh, but essentially, they did all of that because they know uh, that Symphony is the backtrack to My Christmas Star BBC advert. And they've used that as an immersive experience to draw down from the song lyrics 
all this musical themed language and you can see it there on her board. She's got rhapsody, chorus, pitch, melodic choir and more. And she's going to get her children to think about running some of this language as an ongoing stretch metaphor through the writing. I cannot wait to read that. I'll see uh, Mrs West and Darwin class tomorrow at half ten. I will see loads more as well. Uh, we are going to have a special appearance from uh, Grandma Fantastic. So that's exciting, but I don't know when. And uh, I just want to give all the teachers a big fat heart burst who've already got involved. And I will meet you and your kids tomorrow at half ten. Thank you, everybody. It's always a delight. Um, sleep well tonight. We've got a big My Christmas Star Day tomorrow. And I'll see your children then.